Okay, should we go? All right. There's uh, spots in front. Okay. <laughs> We're talking about search. How do we find things? How do we find information in the real world when you've got a pile of books and a research assistant? I'm going to call him Tim, maybe. Today, I'm going to take you through a story of finding information in the real world as a way of giving you a visceral understanding of how search works in Mark Logic. And I'll be pointing out the parallels as we go. Uh, and then I'll open it up to questions about anything you want. Um, so how do we find information in the real world? Well, you know, I say, Tim, we need to get our act together here. This is chaos. Um, how about we just number all our books? We got books and articles and printouts and tweets and Lord knows what. And I'm going to ask you a question, and you just give me a list of the documents that satisfy that. And then if I want to look at one further, I'll, I'll just say, give me document number five, and you'll bring it to me. And he goes, OK, boss. So, Tim, first question. Get me a list of documents about dogs. And he goes, uh, hang on there, boss. You got to break it down for me a little bit. What do you mean, about dogs? I go, OK, fair enough. Give me a list of documents that have the word dog in them. He goes, well, now, just to be clear, Singular, plural, does it matter? I go, no, 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 no. Just all those endings, it's all the same, I don't care. So he says he picks up the first book and starts scanning for dog. So Tim's going to be at this a while, so let's double click a little bit on what happened there. First thing is we have to find words. Uh, English speakers think this is easy. Look for white space, look for punctuation, everything in between is a word, right? Well, mostly right. There's some. Uh, interesting edge cases involving apostrophes and hyphens. Um, but it's not a bad algorithm for English. It's more or less the algorithm Mark Logic uses. But for another language, like, say, Chinese, where there's no white space between words, it's a terrible algorithm. So the first thing to know is that Tim, like Mark Logic, needs to identify words. And in uh, Mark Logic, this is a process called tokenization. And it's a process that will vary from language to language. And the other thing was this, ah, I don't care about the endings thing, right? We're saying that DOG and DOGS are somehow the same word. Uh, this is a process called stemming. And this is, again, obviously a language-specific process, because the rules of French and the rules of English are not the same rules. Um, and now we get into a realm where, like all things about natural language, it depends. Opinions differ. It's not clear. So yeah, there's the noun dog, but it's a verb. Um, you know, someone dogged your steps. I don't really want a bunch of books about a detectives in San Francisco, right? There's dogged, an adjective formed from the verb. There's doggedly. Are all these the word dog? Well, etymologically, sure. Uh, from an information retrieval point of view, probably not. Um, but it depends on what you're trying to achieve with these questions, which makes sense, whether you want to cast your net wide, have a high recall, or be more focused and have a good precision. Let's see how Tim's getting on. Well, Tim is not getting along very well. I've waited days, and he's still not done with his simple question. I say, Tim, what about it? He says, hey, man, I'm just one guy. And that's true. He's a single node. He's not very scalable. Uh, you know, if I took him to a speed reading course, maybe I could scale him up a little bit. But it's not working very well. What can we do? He says, hey, let's hire some interns. We can give them each their own desk, their own stack of books, divide up the books evenly. It'll be great. I say, fine, let's do that. So now we've got a cluster. 50 interns. It goes 50 times faster. Not quite. Right? There's just some of our interns may be uh, faster readers than others. Um, but even still, we gave them the same number of books. That doesn't mean they have the same amount of work. Just by happenstance, one guy got the entire stack of Encyclopedia Britannica, and the other guy got 
a stack of tweets. Who's going to be done sooner? But we can improve on this situation. We can, we can have some interns roaming through the network looking for who's done with work and shuffle books from here to there. Well, now, Tim is supposed to keep track of who has what, so we're going to have to coordinate with Tim about where things got moved around. And if we've got a lot of interns moving in our network, they might crash into each other, books flying everywhere, packet collision. Um, but we can get this to work pretty well. And it's a pretty effective scheme. And as long as we're willing to hire more interns, we can scale it out. Congratulations, we now have a MapReduce cluster. Um, and so now, you know, instead of it taking all week, maybe it takes a day or a couple hours to answer my questions. So we have scale out, and MarkLogic does scale out too, although we don't shuffle the data around. We'll look at that in a minute. Oops, sorry. Um, but notice if I ask the same question tomorrow, it takes the same amount of time. And if I ask a different question, I'm shuffling data around again. Because it could have been just by happenstance, this guy, all the books he was looking at had dog in the first paragraph. He's done so quick. But now I ask about cat, and he has to scan them all the way to the end. So we need to reshuffle the data. Can we do better? I say, Tim, Tim, can we do better? He says, well, you know, boss, we're spending a lot of time. I should point that way, shouldn't I? We're scanning these books over and over again. Let's just scan them once. And when we see a word, we'll just make an index card. We'll write the word at the top of that index card. We'll write the document number on that index card. If it's a word we've seen before, we'll just add the document number to that index card. We'll store them in filing cabinets. We'll give each of the interns their own filing cabinet. This will be great. Now, to answer the question, we just Pull out the filing cabinet to the Ds, go to the D card, the dog card, pull it out and copy those numbers down. Very fast. Now I can barely have time to go get coffee. It's not like even my lunch break anymore. And we can do more complicated queries just as easily. Dog and cat, pull the dog card, pull the cat card, run down the list of numbers that are in order and just copy over the ones that are on both. Or, same thing, not dog and not wolf. One's on here, that aren't on there, copy it over. And this is, this is an inverted index. This is the basic data structure behind every search engine since the first search engine memorialized in the search engine monument in Dayton. Um, this is the universal index in MarkLogic, and we'll get to uh, why we call it universal in a second. And it's highly effective. But we now have a, a difference in an asymmetry in our, our work, right? We have Tim, my research assistant. He's the one I ask questions. He doesn't have a filing cabinet. He's just keeping track of the interns. He's the e-node. And we have the interns with their filing cabinets, OK? They have the data. They're the d-nodes. Haven't tackled the other half of this equation. I said, you give me a list of document numbers. What conceivable use is it to know that document five is a match for my query? I know nothing, right? So we want some sense of which ones are better matches. And I would put it to you, all things being equal, Let's see if I can get a laser pointer, the document with three cats is more about cats than document with two cats. These are my cats, aren't they beautiful? Um, well, since we're scanning through the whole document from start to finish when we first get it, we can actually gather information about how many times things occur. Instead of just writing the document number when we see the word, we can just keep a tally mark of how many times we saw it, like this. So in document number 243, we saw that word twice, but in document 3204, we saw it 12 times. And we can keep tally marks of how many documents we saw the word in. So in the language of search engines, this is term frequency, how many times the word occurred in the document. 
and document frequency, how many documents it occurred in. And this is the basis of scoring. And there's lots of different scoring algorithms. There's lots of ways of tweaking scoring algorithms. Uh, I gave a talk about this two Mark Logics ago, I think. All the bells and whistles in Mark Logic around scoring. But at its core, it's all about tally marks, term frequency, document frequency. And the default scoring in Mark Logic is something called log TF IDF. Um, we take the log of these numbers because it makes the math work better. Uh, and actually, technically, it's uh, normalized long TF-IDF. But be that as it may, let's press on with our story. Okay, so I can get my answers back in pretty complicated queries in, you know, in a coffee break. But one of the interns comes to me and complains and says, hey, Mary, you keep asking about the same stuff over and over again and I have to go to my filing cabinet and root through it and copy down the same card over and over again. How about you just get me a little card box and I'll keep it on my desk and the cards I pull the most often I'll put in there and if it gets too full I'll tidy it up. That way I don't even have to go to my filing cabinet, it'll be right there on my desk. And I go, fantastic, let's do that. I'm gonna buy all the interns a card box for their desk. So now, you know, they're going to need slightly bigger desks. Uh, there's a trade-off there. This is the list cache. Here, list cache in MarkLogic, it's just a box of cards on the Dnode's desk. We can take this further. If you think about my research here, right, researching all about cats, so I want you know, I'm looking at running, but in the context of cat. So I always have this contextual query, right? Cat or feline and not mountain lion or cougar. Running, but cat and feline, but not mountain lion or cougar. Sleep, uh, you know, cat and feline, but not mountain lion or cougar. So it's always that extra query I'm tacking onto everything. And the interns come to me and complain, as they would, because honestly, this is not a job for humans. I'm glad we give it to computers. They say, look, you're asking the same question over and over again. Can't we do something about this? And it annoys me too, because I have to always be adding that same question. And I say, okay, fine, here's what we'll do. I'll call this Mary's research query number one. And when you figure out the answer to it, make a card labeled Mary's research query number one. And we'll put that in your card box. And then I will henceforth just ask, running and Mary's research query number one. Sleeping and Mary's research query number one. This is a registered query. It's just a special card in the card box that you give a special name to. What about all these books? Well, there's no point leaving these lying around on the desks. We looked at them once, right? So let's just store them down in the basement. We'll give each of the interns their own shelf. Um, so they can find stuff, it'll be great. Until it's not great. Now our, our basement is full, the fire marshal is complaining. Uh, oh my gosh, what can we do about this mess? Well, the librarian says to me, Mary, have I got the technology for you. This is ancient technology. You've probably never seen this. That's got about 100 pages. So tiny. I mean, even before my eyes went, I couldn't read this. But the advantage is these are, they're all the same size, they're very compact, and you can just store them all together in these nice little drawers. Fantastic. Well, MarkLogic kind of goes that way too. We don't store your documents in their big bloaty native format. We compress them down into little, little squares of acetate, or the moral equivalent of it. Um, those are the compressed trees. But, of course, you can't do anything with them that way. You have to expand them out. There's a special little expander machine, and in this analogy, I guess you'd print them out. Um, so now we have expanded trees and compressed trees. I really should try and use a laser pointer. So, just, yeah. so expanded trees, which you can read and do something with, and compressed trees, which are very compact, but otherwise are not terribly useful. 
And one of the interns, the interns, they, they complain a lot, but it's a good thing. He says, Mary, the basement is a long way away. And it's dark, and it's scary, and there's only one ladder, so I'm always waiting for it. How about I just keep a stack of the compressed microfiches right here on my desk, of the ones you, you ask for the most? Because you tend to ask for the same books over and over again. And you know, if it gets too tall, I'll tidy it up. And Tim says, you know, that's an excellent point. We keep having to take these to the expander machine and reprint them out. I'll keep a copy of the ones I print out the most right here on my desk. And then when you ask for a book, instead of having to wait for the intern to go run down to the basement, I'll just hand it to you right from my desk. Fantastic idea. This is the compressed tree cache and the expanded tree cache. Now, we're in the land of trade-offs again. We're, we're allocating more desk space, right? So now we've got the card boxes taking up some space. The compressed tree cache has taken up some space. If we've got a mixed ED node, we got the expanded tree cache has taken up some space. Think desktop is your memory. You've got to balance those out. Decide how much versus the cost of running down to the basement. Speaking of running down to the basement, people do not have a good understanding of times in the computer world. So it's. If, if an execution cycle is a heartbeat, right? right, then the fastest memory, the L1 cache, the fastest one, that's like picking something up off the desktop. Main memory is more like where the basement is. In fact, main memory is more like the scene in Hidden Figures, you know, where she has to run all the way across campus to get to the colored women's bathroom and all the way back. That's how far away main memory is. Disk, oh, disk. Disk is a hike up the Pacific Crest Trail. You're walking to Seattle to get that book. Now, in, in, you, there's a lot of caches in the OS and the IO subsystem between you and the spinning disk. But if you have to go to the spinning disk, you're walking to Seattle. And maybe you've got a fast disk, you're bicycling to Seattle, but it's still a long, long way away. So this is why we really kind of want to keep things in cache so we don't have to do that. Meanwhile, back in our story, this system is working great. I'm asking all these questions. So someday I come to Tim and I say, Tim, get me a list of all the books with Hungry Cat in them. And he goes, oh, hmm. Well, OK. I'll ask the interns for Hungry and Cat. They know how to answer that with their cards and their filing cabinets. And then I'll take that list, I'll get the books, I'll scan through them, and the ones that are really a match, I'll tell Mary about those. Well, what is this? <laughs> those of you who've done Mark Logic Search for a while know what this is. This is index resolution and filtering, right? I didn't have the indexes I needed to answer this question with index resolution, so I need to filter i.e., I need to hike to Seattle. This is why filtering is slow. I'm hiking to Seattle to get all those books. Um, or I could say, well, OK, that's taken a long time. How about you just give me the answer? But now I'm getting false positives, because I'm getting things that have hungry and cat, but not necessarily together. What can we do about this? Well, let's just make a card for it. Why not? When we first scan the books, instead of just making cards for each word we see, we can make a card for each pair of words we see. Um, in Mark logic terms, this is what's called fast phrase. Now I say, all the books with hungry cat, pull the hungry cat card. We're done. Well, what about a three word phrase? Two hungry cats. Well, now we're back to scanning again. And you say, well, I can make a three-word card. But this can be extended indefinitely and to silliness. You know, two hungry cats looking out the window at a squirrel on the fence. Is there really going to be a card for that? No, that would be, that would be silly. Uh, in Mark Logic, we stop at two. But we need another solution. And the solution is to observe that, look, we're scanning the whole book. We're keeping a tally mark of how many times we see a word. 
why don't we just keep track of what word position it is? So, you know, it was the 12th word, it was the 50th word. Uh, in Mark Logic parlance, this would be word positions. Now, it's going to take longer to scan the books initially. I'm going to need bigger filing cabinets. But now, you know, if I want to answer that question, it's, you know, I need to do a little bit of math with the positions, maybe. But I also can answer more complicated questions. I can do cat and dog, near squirrel and fence. But the more complicated the query gets, the more complicated the scratch calculations I need to do. And there's an internal data structure where we're doing these calculations. It's not really visible to you on the outside, but that's the positions list scratch array. And uh, if you've ever seen XDMP positions max, that's what this is about. All right. So we now have two ways to answer the same query, right? I can pull, if I do give you a two hungry cats, well, I could do it as those three words looking at positions. I could do it as two, two word queries, maybe both. What's the right answer? And the answer is it can get pretty complicated pretty fast. I'm not going to talk about all the trade-offs here. But I will say, if you want to know what question we sent to the interns, what cards we asked them to pull, that's what XDMP plan is. That is exactly telling you what we're asking the indexes. And so anytime anyone asks me, why isn't my search giving me what I thought it should, I say, what does XDMP plan show you? Because that's where we're using the indexes we have to decide what questions to ask. And we try and ask them in a way that will give you accurate results without having to hike to Seattle. My ambitions grow. Tim is answering all my questions. I say, hey, Tim, how about all the books that have cat in the title? And he goes, oh, I guess we're going to need to make some new kind of cards for this, because I don't know how to answer that. But it's still OK. We can do this. Whenever we see a word, we can make a card with that word. And we can make a card with that word in whatever part of the document it's in. Cat in title, cat in footnote, cat in paragraph. And so now, again, it's just a card pull, again. And so we can do it quickly. So this is element or property level scoping. When you do an element word query, we're pulling that element word card out of the index. Now we have uh, element scoping. You sort of start to discover, or I start to discover, that I'm asking things in a very repetitive way. I say I want cat in title, or cat in summary, or cat in abstract. Dog in title, or dog in summary, or dog in abstract. It's always those same three elements over and over again. And this is starting to annoy me. And I say, Tim, this is starting to annoy me. Um, now, this isn't a registered query, because the query term itself is different every time. It's the same set of elements that I'm looking at. Can't we just sort of create, I don't know, some abstract field? Let's call it the aboutness field. And any time you see a word in one of any of those elements, make a card that says cat in aboutness field, or whatever. And sure, we can do that. And that's named fields. Um, you can do a lot more with named fields in MarkLogic. But that's the gist of it, is identifying different parts of the document and treating them as one thing. Now, notice this is a little different than what we've seen before. Before, the document told us what we were putting in the filing cabinet, right? What word we saw, what element we saw. Here, I had to provide some information. I want to find these. And, you know, by the way, there's a trade-off here too, right? This is going to take longer to process the documents in the first place. I'm going to need bigger filing cabinets. But my payoff is when I do queries. They're quicker to calculate, because I'm only pulling one card instead of a bunch of cards. Um, and they're simpler for me to formulate, because I only have to remember one name instead of three. Uh, so it creates an abstract uh, name that I can remember. All right. And once we start talking about element scoping, we can start talking about 
just structural scoping in general, not to words, but to other structural elements. And here is where I think we should, could say that Mark logic kind of jumps the shark relative to other search engines. Other search engines store indexes about words, but we can store indexes about containment of parent-child relations, what was the root element, those kinds of structural properties. And then we can, they're just cards in the card index. We can combine them with any other kind of query in the same exact way. You know, at some level, you don't even have to know what kind of thing it was. So this is parent-child scoping. And here's where we start getting into the universal part of universal index. Let's talk about security. Because this system is working so great Right? I get answers to all kinds of complicated questions, like, you know, black dog in title, and there's a footnote in a figure that has a caption. I can, I can ask and answer questions like that in the time it takes me to sip my coffee. So everyone wants in on this deal. But I have books I don't want everybody to see. Special books, the special collection. I want those locked up and available to me, but not everybody else. But we know what the game is at this point. We're going to make a card. It's our answer to everything, right? And so Tim is going to be the gatekeeper of the, the card, of the keys. And the way it's going to work is I am now going to assert, this is purely coming from me. This is not intrinsic in the documents at all. I'm going to say this document is in the special collection. So put it on the special collection card. And this document is general access, so put it on the general access card. Then I come along and I say, Tim, get me a list of all the books that have black dog in the title. And Tim says, I know you. You're Mary. You have access to the special collection and general access. And he turns around, and the question he asks the interns is black dog in title and general access or special collection access. Joe Schmo comes along, asks the same question, black dog in title. And Tim looks and says, I know you, you're Joe Schmo. You have general access. So the question he asks the interns is different. Black dog in title and general access. So if there is a book that's black dog in title and it's special, it won't even match that query. It's at that level, at the lowest level, it's just not visible. And this is how Mark Logic does document level security, right? There's permissions on each document, different locks on each document, and those are applied when you ask the question automatically. You can't, you can't evade it. Um, it's not under your control. It's inside. And we have cards for everything, right? We have cards for security. We have cards for elements. We have cards that tell us about properties we assert about the documents, such as document collections. We have cards for how we process the documents. So there's a card that said, I index this, this document with fast phrase turned on. And you say, why did you do that? And that's how the re-indexer works. The re-indexer does queries to determine what needs to be re-indexed. And it's just as fast as anything else. So, just think about what's in the universal index, things that can be boiled down to atomic facts about the document. Is this true of this document? And those can be things implicit in the document, intrinsic to it, like the words or the elements. It can be structural things. What's the root element? What parent-child relations are there? It can be facts I assert from the outside about the document, right? Like the security, or this has a red binding. And also, we keep some track of some of our own internal processing of the document. So what have we seen? I have no idea how much time I've used. I have a feeling I went too quick or too slow. Um, so we've seen E nodes and D nodes. And we've seen scale out of the cluster. And think about, think about this as interns and research assistants. Right? Index resolution, which is scanning the book. I mean, index resolution is pulling cards out of the filing cabinets. And 
uh, filtering, which is scanning things line by line. The list cache. It's just a little card box on the desk of the most commonly used cards from the index. And registered queries, which is just special named cards that we put into that box. We have compressed trees, which are very compressed, but you can't read. And we have expanded trees, which are ones you can actually do something with. And we have caches of those, so that we don't have to hike to Seattle every time we want to see a book. There's positions calculations, if you have positions index turned on, but they can get complicated. And if someone wants to ask me about, you know, why they can get so complicated after, we can talk about that. And there's a scratch pad we need to have on hand to do those calculations. We index all kinds of facts, and they all go into the same filing cabinet, the universal index. Um, this is where MarkLogic is a little different from most search engines. And we have document level security. It's just another card in the card box, in the, in the index. And um, with that, I guess I will take questions on this or anything about search. Life, the universe. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I think we got a, a mic that's running around. Hi, I love the presentation, and um, you mentioned you want to talk a little bit more about positions and the challenges there. I'd really love to hear about that. All right, positions. So imagine you're doing, say, cat and dog near uh, rat and mouse. So what you're really asking there is that combination, some combination of a cat and a dog is near some combination of a mouse and a rat which means you have to know what all those combinations are in order to figure it out. And you sort of say, well, can't you cut this down a little bit? And yeah, I mean, you can, but then you get into these overlap cases and what counts as near there. Um, and so there, the more clauses you add to a positions sensitive query, the more combinations we have to calculate and it can get kind of this exponential blowout, basically. And so, and, and and near within and and near are particularly dangerous. And so, in general, we'll, like I, I think it, it said on the slide, but I didn't say out loud, we try and avoid positions calculations if we can possibly avoid it because of that. And, um, you know, it's, it's shocking that I've seen some cases where you have a document that has a lot of repeated elements and someone's trying to use an element scope with some complicated query inside. And you can get, on a single document, millions of combinations that we're processing. And so we actually do try and cut those off. If it gets too long, we'll just say, ah, odds are it's a match. Let the filter figure it out. You know, I, dare, I defy you to tell me I'm wrong, basically. Um, and we give you some control over that so that you can fail fast with an error if it gets too big or there's some trace events that let you say, well, no, I really want to dedicate lots of memory to this problem. Um, but yeah, it's best to uh, try and uh, avoid those kinds of blowout situations. So creating a field where sort of you've pre-calculated some of those combinations can actually help a lot with those kinds of circumstances. Yeah. Anybody else? Oh, come on. Yeah. Hi, Mary. Um, your bottom line there is document level security. What kind of funky cards are you doing for element level security? In <laughs> well, yeah, that's actually fairly frightening. Um, the first answer I would say is if you want the gory details, you should ask Hightown, who did the heavy lifting there. Um, but essentially what it comes down to is, yeah, we have special keys for each protected path. So element level security is new in Mark Logic 9 you can protect certain paths in your document. You can say, you know, um, only people with a certain role can see titles, whatever. Uh, or let's give you more realistic examples, social security numbers. So there is a special key that includes both the role and sort of the normal key that we calculate. And when we do the query, we look at the roles of the person to use, figure out what keys to use to search. And so for a person with a normal role, 
it's, it's as if that doesn't even exist, the, the, that particular, uh, the words in that particular element. And so this needs to be carried through to all the different kinds of wonderful like values and elements and ranges and all, all of that. So it's, it's uh, yeah, it's fairly, uh, fairly complex, but Hightow did a great job, so it works. Mm -hmm. uh, Uh, so the question is, are you talking about document security or element security? Uh, element security. So element level security, is that done once or search? It's, well, so it's always part of search. How we formulate the search will depend on your role and what the protected paths are. And it's also an indexing time thing that we will index things a certain way depending on what protected paths you have. And so it's... You know, search is always about matching what's in the index, what's in the card catalog, with what's in the query, formulated query. And so it's, you know, it's a little of both. You have something? Yeah? So we have, in the universal index, there are keys, we call them, or in the metaphor here, a card for element-child relations. So there's a card that says, it is a fact that this document has um, a caption and a figure. It is a fact that this document has a root element of article. And so there's a card that says that. And there's queries you can do that will access that. Now in the case of element-child, it's not like there's an element-child query. It comes from the paths you use in the search, or if you use an XPath, what the XPath was. It's not a separate index. It's a separate card in the index. So yeah, there's a descendant. There's a descendant. We call it a descendant key in the index. Um, you, like I said, we have we have way more kinds of keys in the index than we have query CTS query operators. Uh, and some of these are used internally or are sort of implicitly used in how we formulate the queries. And this is why I say look at the plan because you'll you'll start to see some of these in the plans and you'll say. What is that? Um, and that's why the query formulation is trying to make, take advantage of what we have in the index to answer the question the best it can. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah, well, that's interns for you, isn't it? <laughs> it was all totally clear and obvious? Yeah. Oh, wild cards. Yeah. So this is, this is one of the most, this is the bane of my existence, in all honesty. We have, so the indexes we have available, let's put it this way, is we have three character indexes. So for every three characters, there's a, there's a card that says this sequence of three characters appeared. Uh, we actually have a little more than that. We know whether they were at the beginning or end of a word. Um, and then there's the trailing wildcard index, which is, this word, so three or more characters, uh, I'm saying this badly. So if you have the word anteater, then you know it starts with A-N-T something or A-N-T-E something. There's separate keys for each of those, but it, we only go three or, or more. So then people do wild cards where it's, you know, A star B. You go, okay, there's no three character sequence in there. What can we do? Um, and we do have one character and two character, but you're going to need a big filing cabinet if you turn those on. So, you know, if you've ever looked in the admin UI, you'll see they're grayed out, and that's why we kind of don't encourage that. So what we do is we do a trick. Um, if you have what's called a word lexicon, I haven't really talked about, but it's, it's a list of all the words we saw. And, you know, it's got the actual words in there. Whereas, you know, I wrote the word on the card, but we don't actually have the word on our cards. We just have a a number, a key. Um, so if you have a word lexicon, you can ask the word lexicon, give me all the words that match this pattern, A star B. And then we can say, okay, that's the list of words, we'll do that as a query. Now, the problem is, you can get too many words. And so if we ran the query that way, it would be a huge query and it would take forever. And so we say, well, okay, let's try and condense it so that we turn it into 
what are the unique three character sequences or prefixes and suffixes. And so there's a lot of variation there that we try and sort of balance between having a query that takes too long and having a query that's accurate. And you know, the end result is I think there's plenty of cases where you throw some kind of combination of data and query and it's not something we can really resolve accurately in a reasonable amount of time. Now in Mark Logic, we said, if we've given you a little more control, you can say, I don't care. However long it takes, do it the best way possible. You may learn to regret that decision. <laughs> um, we've also given you the option of saying, no, no, if it's going to take a long time, just throw an error, right? And I will handle my application to tell the user they need to come up with a better query. Um, but I mean, this is one of those cases where we often do not have the indexes we need to resolve it. So you either need to filter, i.e. hike to Seattle, um, or accept there'll be some false matches. So yeah, that's the ins and outs of wildcards. Somewhere in the back, yeah? Y yes, how you doing? Um, how do you guys, what's the strategy for handling fuzzy matches? Fuzzy matches. Um, I think there's a lot of different strategies you could apply. We don't have a fuzzy match um, query constructor, I guess. Um, and I think there's basically two ways you could go about that. Um, one is you could, you could if, if you imagine a word, right? Uh, I had an eater before, fine. So if you were to, in your query builder, take anteater and kind of create a shingling of all the three word combinations, the three character combinations in that, and or them together, that's actually not a bad fuzzy search for anteater, right? Because, and you, if you rely on scoring to push the ones that match most to the top. Um, in MarkLogic 9, there's another way to go about this. We have a, um, a plugin. API for stemmers. So you could make a custom stemmer that does like Soundex, for example, uh, that delegates to the standard stemmer, so you get both, uh, and then use that, use it as a stem search. Um, and you know, I, the ins and outs of that are a little involved, but if you want to talk after, we can talk about that. Filtered versus unfiltered. Yeah, well, I mean, we talked a little about that. Um, unfiltered means, so there's two, phase, there's two phases of, of search in MarkLogic, right? There's the question we ask the indexes, and then, optionally, you can actually look at the actual documents to sort of verify. And it comes, to, there will be a difference if the indexes are incomplete for the question you're trying to ask. So for example, with wildcards. You ask a wildcard search and you have, let's say you have no wildcard indexes turned on at all. There's no way I can answer that question. So I, this is gonna be a terrible example, but I gonna return you everything in the database, right? If you say A star B and you have no wildcard indexes, I'm gonna say, well, everything I know about matches. And then the filter will have to look and the filter has the expanded tree in its hand and the qu original query in its hand and it's just, it's gonna run through the whole thing looking. Whereas index resolution, that is to say unfiltered search is index resolution, it has the query as formulated and we only formulate it to what can the indexes answer given your index settings. And so that may be very incomplete depending on your index settings. And so you certainly want to try and arrange it so you have all the index settings you need, and I guess no more, because <laughs> um, they're a waste of space otherwise, um, so that you don't need to filter. Um, or, I mean, the other way to slice this is you say, I'm willing to accept wrong answers as long as the score puts the good answers to the top, right? And some people approach it that way. That's, you know, that's how Google works. You think the millionth, hit on Google answers your question really, go look, I'm telling you it doesn't, right? And so it's relying on score so that you don't have to actually go check and make sure you were just rely on the indexes. Does that answer your question? Uh, 
Um, can you, actually, can you give him the microphone and just say a little more what you're looking for? Um, so let's say you do a search and you want to surf, um, you, you don't get any results for a particular search and you want to provide suggestions. Did you mean based on dictionary terms? Um, so, well, there's, a, there's several ways to slice this. I mean, one way is there's the word lexicon. Right. And the word lexicon, it's, it's an index you can enable. And the word lexicon is a list of all words in the database. And you can constrain it to a particular search. And that search can be a document URI. Okay. So you can say, what are all the words in this document? Um, and so one could potentially use that as a way to make suggestions or something like that. Um, the other way to slice that is, I've seen what some customers do actually, is they take, they periodically run the word lexicon and use it to create a spelling dictionary mm -hmm. using our spell API. And you know, this is sort of a back office thing they do periodically, um, not all the time. And then you can use the spelling APIs to make spell suggestions that way too. Wow, no one has any questions. Yeah? What about documents versus document properties? Sure. Uh, documents versus document properties. So the, the advantage of putting things in the document itself is uh, well, I guess it's right there. And the thing is that um, when you store something in properties, it's actually in a separate, we would call it a fragment. It's actually in a, a separate storage unit than the document itself. And so that means that to search across, to, com to combine things with the property and the document is, is a join of, of a sort. You know, and it's a join we can do, um, but it, it is that extra step. Whereas if it were all in the document, it would just be a straight intersection of term, terms that we'd look up. So there's that trade-off. But on the other hand, um, the sort of the charm of putting it in the properties is you're not messing with your document. And I think where you've heard a lot, or you will hear a lot, people talking about the envelope pattern, it's kind of like trying to have their cake and eat it too. Whereas I'm leaving my original stuff alone and I'm just augmenting it, but it's all part of the same document. So from a search point of view, it's, it's quicker and easier. And I think so that's why people are kind of gravitating to that. But there are certainly some, some things in MarkLogic require the use of properties. So if you're using the content processing framework or FlexRep or alerting uh, application, those are all using things in the properties. Um, if you have a document like a binary document, you've got no option, right? If I'm storing an image file in MarkLogic, you can't really go stuffing random stuff into the image file. And so the properties are, are good, good use for that. So it depends. Like all answers in computer science, it depends. Mary, I think unfortunately this is all the time we have. We're all Thank done. you so much for your great session. Thank you all.